Hello and welcome to Security in Context. I am Anita Fuentes and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Branko Milanovic, a senior scholar at the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality at the City University of New York and acclaimed author of numerous books, including his latest work, Visions of Inequality, published in 2023. Hi, Branko. Welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Hello, Anita. It was really a pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me. Sure. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so let's start with, with your latest book, Visions of Inequality. Um, this book delves into the perspectives of economists over the past two centuries on the issue of inequality as illustrated through the lives of, um, through the lives and works of six pivotal figures, uh, Francois Quenet, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Karl Marx, uh, Wilfredo Pareto, and Simon Kuznets. So I have a double question to start, double challenge. Um, first, I would like to know what inspired you to juxtapose the works of these particular economists and how uh, does their work inform our understanding of contemporary inequality? And I think this is related. What are some of the key themes or lessons that uh, our listeners and viewers can glean from and the readers of the book, of course, can glean from the historical evolution of economic thought on income inequality as presented in, in your book? Okay, there are quite a few questions there. Uh, okay, let me start with the choice. You know, you basically explained the choice by essentially saying these are pivotal figures. So it was not very difficult to make the choice. You know, uh, uh, Kenny and Adam Smith are really the founders of political economy. And then Smith, Ricardo, and Marx very often go as like a, like a trio, you know, uh, because they are classical economists. And then Pareto is the first who have actually studied uh, income distribution at a personal level rather than between the classes. And Kuznets, of course, is an extremely important person that whom we still use, you know, the, the Kuznets curve is still used in study of income distribution. So it was not very difficult. On top of that, these are the authors whom I have actually been reading for many years, actually probably Marx for 40 years, and you know, Adam Smith probably the first time when I read it was 30 years ago. Of course, there are some issues <clears throat> that possibly people have raised this issue, like for example, <clears throat> why not Keynes? And you know, there are interesting pros and cons. And so there are a couple of authors, maybe who have been who could have been also included, uh, but I think that the choice of the six makes lots of sense. And uh, we, I mean, as I said, I could have added maybe one or two others. Now, what can we learn from them? Uh, first of all, uh, I think you know economics is a social science, so we need to actually know what other people have written about the social science because the situation is not different, fundamentally different today than they, it was like 200 years ago, especially when you read Adam Smith or Marx. We're still using them on, on a daily basis. But in this particular thing, which deals with income distribution, I think that the advantage of uh, uh, reading or actually interpreting, because what they did really, I interpreted what they said about income distribution because they don't have none of them maybe with the exception of Pareto <clears throat> or Kuznets but the others do not have a chapter saying income distribution you know so you really have to interpret what they're saying uh, the advantage of that is that it shows you that um, they were very much concerned and I think we should be concerned today as well with class structure of society, with the fact that you have a very high concentration of capital incomes into the hands of very few people, that uh, most of the population has zero or very minimal capital incomes, that these capital incomes contribute to inequality. And this was something which was kind of lost in the latter part of the 20th century with the neoclassical revival. And I think in that sense, indirectly, they tell us what we have missed. But also more directly, they also uh, relate to the more, you know, contemporary attempts, which started to some extent with Piketty's book, you know, in 2013, which is about bringing back the importance of capital incomes, <coughs> bringing them to the fore, much more than was the case in the past. And finally, it also, uh, when we look at the uh, current situation, we 
have other cleavages. This is a gender cleavage for which they were not very much interested. It's not present very much in their work. But the racial or slavery in those days, cleavage, was very important. So that has again become important. We luckily don't have slavery, but we have racial discrimination, differences in wages based on on ethnicity or caste or or race. So, you know, that aspect as well is something that we can actually learn from them and compare the way that they have studied with what we study today. You also uh, briefly discussed the contributions of Latin American economists from the Dependencia School um, <coughs> to the study of income distribution. Uh, so could you elaborate more on the significance of their work and its impact on the study of um, inequality? I, and I think it'd be particularly interesting for our audience to, uh, bearing in mind that, you know, our audience are not necessarily economists, um, uh, to, to hear <laughs> to hear your thoughts on how the study of income inequality in Latin America differed from that in Europe Uh, and the United States in the Cold War era, and you know what unique perspectives uh, were brought by Latin American economists to to the field of income inequality. You know, the Cold War era, with which I deal in Chapter Seven of the book, and it's a long chapter, was very special because. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it was very special period because uh, both sides, meaning socialist or communist and capitalist side tried to pretend that they don't have a class-based societies. You know, communist countries essentially said, we have we got rid of private ownership of capital so that the division between capitalists and workers no longer exists. Consequently, we do not have class structure. But the society was hierarchically organized, so there was no class-based uh, difference on capital, but there was class-based difference on hierarchical position. On the other hand, uh, and in res uh, response to that, capitalist societies, and especially the United States, claimed that there was no class structure because everybody could, that was the argument, everybody could accede to any position, you know, you could actually have high social mobility and so forth. Uh, Latin America was, in my opinion, uh, different for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, they did not need to follow that bilateral or class or basically Cold War based uh, approach because it really did not participate to the same extent in the Cold War. Secondly, uh, the economists Latin America, in, in Latin America could not deny the importance of inequality because it was so obvious. You know, these countries had and have very high inequality. They had also, like Brazil, racial discrimination, They and actually other countries with indigenous population. So it was obvious you could not deny something. For the American side, it was easier to deny because they claimed, of course, they have this uh, view of everybody being able to, as I was saying before, to, to fulfill the American dream. So these are the two differences that London American economists had. And the, the third one, which I think in my case, in what I uh, study, was quite important. I mentioned it in the book. Although I use Samir Amin, who is a non-Latin non American economist, he is Egyptian, but he had the same dependencia or the world systems theory approach. Uh, they actually introduced something which was entirely new, is that they started looking at domestic income distribution as being largely determined by outside forces. Not that somebody imposes the government on you, but that your uh, 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 mode of production or the way that you, things that you produce are the result of an international division of labor. And that international division of labor determines social classes that are in power in your country. So in other words, they did not look at income distribution in, let's suppose, Brazil or Argentina or Egypt, in the case of Samir Amin, as simply determined by social forces within the country. They saw the position of the country in the global arena, and that position then implied that you had to have what they called often the comprador bourgeoisie that was linked to the external centers of power, 
and you had most of the population with very little influence or actually they were what is called disarticulation because there were no really other links uh, uh, economic links within the country. So uh, between the comprador bourgeoisie and the rest. So that was really a very new way of looking at income distribution. It, it was not present either in Smith or even in Marx. Marx actually started looking at global issues uh, because, you know, that was, you know, he was in the latter part of the 19th century, but they never thought of the of the fact that your domestic social structure can be influenced to such an extent from the outside. So that was for me the novelty which they brought. Right, and and speaking of these more global perspectives, I I also wanted to bring up that you have extensively researched trends in north south inequality and observed how China's rise has significantly altered the global inequality landscape. Um, so outside of China, what trends are you seeing? in within country inequality and divergence with the global north in in regions such as south asia africa and uh latin america and in your view what are the implications of these trends that you've observed you know of course it is a difficult question but if you go back for example and i thought of that recently because it was the 50th anniversary of the new international economic order uh and it was launched in the 1970s after the uh, the first uh, oil crisis and uh, many of the then what is called the third world countries actually wanted to improve their global position both in international relations and uh, uh, in trade and so forth uh, and men what you look then and when you compare with the situation now what you notice is of course china nobody in those days expected China to become a power that has become. Uh, as best China was actually not even a member of non-aligned movement, was not a member of the G77 and so forth. And then uh, secondly, you, you observe uh, really the rise of Asia, so even leaving China aside, uh, more, more recently India, but also Vietnam, Indonesia, to some extent Thailand, uh, these are the countries that have, and Bangladesh quite recently, these are the countries that are actually done quite well by inserting themselves in the international division of labor. That was quite interesting because in those days, 50 years ago, people believed that maybe just by getting out of international division of labor, you would solve your income distribution issue, and on top of that, you would have growth. But in reality, we saw in the case of Asian countries that act, that using international division of labor, using value chains, using exports to the United States, they were able to increase uh, their income really, I mean, several fold. Uh, now, when it comes to the other parts of the world, uh, we do not see the same type of change for Latin American countries. So their position, even in terms of uh, per capita income with respect to the rest of the world, has remained more or less the same as it was then 50 years ago. And for Africa, we actually see really deterioration of African position. And the reason is that the mean income of the world, because of the rise of Asia and the fact that Asia has many people, has gone up quite significantly. Whereas growth rates in Africa, have, in African countries, have been really quite uh, low. So I think we're looking forward uh, into this century, I think the main issue is acceleration of growth in Africa, which then also brings up the issue of climate change, because climate change apparently is going to affect African countries the most severely. And uh, my last question for you um, has to do with a so-called rules-based order and how multilateral institutions like uh, the UN and the World Trade Organization have historically been arenas where developing countries have sought a more equitable global economic system, but there has been a trend of developed countries undermining multilateralism and the very institutions they themselves established, uh, right? So, so what prospects do you see for a revival of multilateralism today? Um, are the current global economic institutions still fit for a uh, purpose? And if not, what could replacement replace them? You know, 
uh, I totally agree with what actually the implication of your question. Uh, we have to distinguish between, even terminologically, between what is called rules-based order, which is basically a term uh, used by, by rich countries to do whatever they want, and international rules. The international rules are the rules uh, that, are, that have been proposed and sort of, to some extent, in, try to implement it by the international organization, especially organizations, especially by the UN. Uh, and to some extent also by the IMF, by the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, uh, which succeeded GATT and so forth. And there was always uh, an attempt by, uh, a justified attempt by uh, uh, non-rich countries, in, those, in, in the past that was the third world countries, to actually have the rules be observed. The problem with rich countries was very often, despite the fact that they were dominant in all these organizations, even in terms of the voting power, for example, in the IMF and the World Bank, they uh, did not like to observe all the rules all the time because they are very powerful. So the rules constrain you. And then sometimes you're powerful and you don't like to observe these rules. So that tension has been really for a long time. And as I said, said before, it is really very well reflected in the, the quotas that existed at the world, that exist in the World Bank and the IMF, which are the quotas essentially, to a large extent, from the 1945. You know, there is no reason, for example, that countries like Belgium and the Netherlands would have a, a percentage of the quota, which is one third, I think, of, of India. It, it just makes no sense. So this is uh, this needs to be changed. But more, I think, fundamentally, we now have a problem of the United States and some European countries actually going backwards in terms of globalization. So we have uh, protectionist movements. These protectionist movements are present in, as you have seen now, with tariffs against China, with Europeans also raising tariffs against China, uh, with uh, much greater impediments to immigration and the results of the elections in Europe. So we basically see a really uh, going away from globalization and from the international rules, mostly by rich countries. So, you know, the, uh, the rest of the world does not have too much choice because it doesn't have power, but it does have a moral obligation, I believe, to push for the observation of international rules, which have been agreed also by the, the most powerful countries. Uh, so I think this is still the, the very pressing issue. I'm not hugely optimistic, but I do see, do see changes. You know, countries like South Africa, Brazil, uh, have now actually India are now saying things that um, that maybe they were not willing to say ten or twenty years ago. Right. I was going to ask you. In fact, if um, there are newly emerging uh, emerging institutions from the global south, such as BRICS, viable alternatives, and you know, if you could elaborate a little bit more on this to wrap up. You know, to, to wrap up, actually, BRICS is a very interesting institution. It is, uh, uh, I think people make a mistake when they say, well, look at BRICS, there are big differences between these countries. Indeed, you know, China and India were at the verge of a, a military conflict, small conflict, but still a conflict. Uh, the interest of Brazil and, for example, Russia do not necessarily coincide and so on. But I think what is important there is not to look at the commonalities, because actually there are not that many commonalities, but to look at what they do not want to be. And they clearly do not want to be part of a sort of Western global NATO. So whoever doesn't want to be part of that basically has to run away and join uh, BRICS, not because they find such great commonality between BRICS, but simply they don't want to participate in the new cold or hot war. Uh, and I think then uh, it's also wrong to believe that BRICS would be dominated by China, simply because if you look at uh, India, India is a country which now has more population than China, has will probably have a higher growth rate than China. But India also doesn't want to be, be part of that sort of uh, new Western alliance. And I think in that sense, we look at, have to look at BRICS in those, uh, from that perspective and not just to look at them as a, as a uh, homogeneous group.
Uh, Branko Milanovic, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Linda. Thanks a lot.